Hello, and welcome to Fort Vancouver Regional Library's 2024 Revolutionary Reads series. This year's series focused on the book Free, Two Years, Six Lives, and the Long Journey Home by Lauren Kessler. This year's program was built in partnership with our community organization, the Foundation, Restore and Prepare, and is made possible through generous support by the FBRL Foundation. Thank you for your interest in this program, and as always, thank you for using your public library. And then, how do you feel about if you were to become a gymnastics star um, on I TV? Think, I think you would do me. Mm -hmm. I would probably, uh, if I had a lot of money, I would have to be able to do that. Oh, but I come this way. And then, if you were to be someone like you. So what you guys see there was a little girl that was 18 months when her dad went to prison and she grew up visiting in the visiting room or spending time with her dad in the visiting room. Um, uh, her mother and I were married, so we were able to have trailer visits, so she was able to come stay the night uh, every three months or however we were able to schedule those visits. Uh, right there, she was 10, uh, probably going on 11, so she never really had no experience with me before uh, that she remembered. Um, and so towards the end, you asked, you heard her ask, like, does Ayel know? Which is her brother. And they were really close. Okay. So, um, she was, you know, even within all that excitement for her, she was wondering, did her brother know? Yeah. So, what's your favorite sport? Football? What about basketball? You like basketball? <laughs> okay, so I have to do this quick little interview. Okay, you gotta follow me. Wait. <laughs> What's your shorts doing? <laughs> 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 oh, yeah. 
So what you see there was a kid, five, six years old, when his dad went away. Uh, he was playing pop corner football, I was volunteer coaching and doing all those things. Uh, and ironically, that gym, we ended up spending a lot of time together in that gym because of the head coach, uh, Brett Henry, the varsity basketball coach over there at Evergreen High School, ended up giving me a job and allowing me to be an assistant coach with him um, while my son from so sophomore, junior, senior year, I coached over there uh, as an assistant in basketball. Um, he was about this tall when I left, if that. And then, as you see, he was towering me a little bit. He towers me even more now. Um, and uh, he happened to be, uh, so I walked in the house with my daughter, and then he happened to be having an open gym at the school, so we were able to go there. Um, at that time, I was um, fighting my case. So I had, so I was going to go into, I had a 24 year sentence. Um, I was released after nine years, and so that was the understanding they had that was going to be happening, and dad was going to come home when they were in their 20s, out of college, I was probably married, you know. Uh, so I was sitting in the county jail for two months before I was released, and they knew stuff was going on, but they didn't know exactly what. And so fast forward two years later, my son's second year of football and he was in kindergarten my daughter she was one and a half at the time and we were like right there gonna turn on to the school property when i was approached by two undercover officers you know they had me get down they cut me put my hands behind my back you know what i mean so i got my two kids here and you know i'm riding to the police station i thought it would end up being nothing Washington Innocent Project is is necessary. These people are the real deal. These people, this is what they're thriving for. This is their goal. And if they don't want to take your case or they can't take your case because of their rules, then that is what it is. But when they take your case, then you know you're in good hands regardless. That feeling that I that I got when I found out I was going back, I think I've just been on that feeling. Ever since, that's why a lot of just bounce off of me nowadays. I'm searching for perfection, so sometimes I'll be overdoing it. I think for the most part, I'm in heaven. You know, my kids like they were like this and this, and now they're like this and this. You know what I mean? Psychologically, you change and you you're warped, but you don't know it. WIP changed my community by getting me home. So imagine how many like good spirited people that WIP can help come home. There's so much compassion, it's so real. They deserve everything they get, you know, like everything you can give them, they deserve it. So that right there was a video um, as you heard, the Innocence Project is who helped me get out. They had someone come down and they did like this thing, followed me on a work day. Uh, so ironically, those videos, they were all taken. And so like, I promise you, this wasn't planned. It wasn't planned for it to be like this. But this, I mean, this was, but having that video, having these things happen, it just happened, right? So now it, we able to see it in real time and I can break things down. So what it was, so now I'm a general contractor. Um, I'm into construction, never was into it growing up. Um, but that's something I do for a living now. And so that's what you've seen. Um, so for, in, for those who don't know, which I think everyone here does, my name is Lester Griffin. I'm the executive director of a new organization called The Foundation, Restore and Prepare, where we work with the youth. We do youth outreach and we 
or uh, and we work with individuals coming home from incarceration. Um, the reason why is because, as you've seen there, in the last few years, that's what I've been doing. I've been working with the youth. There's still guys that play on the basketball team that I deal with that stay in touch with me. They're now in like their mid-20s. These are kids that were kids when I met them in high school and down there adults. And um, uh, I believe we play a significant role in each other's life. As far as the individuals coming home from incarceration, because I was that individual, I have compassion for the ones that are coming home with the plans and ideas of succeeding, who may need just a little bit of help, um, who may need some support from our community and from myself as well. I've always hired guys that came home from prison. Um, they would come work with me. I would give them jobs. Uh, some of them that didn't need me, didn't need to work with me, you know, I might give them a few dollars, put it in their pocket, uh, help them get, uh, take them shopping, just little random things, right? Um, but that's just what I could do. Um, I also had, you know, the reason why I'm like looking at this reentry thing, and we, we're partnering with the Vancouver Housing Authority with uh, transitional housing because I've seen that as well. Individuals that came home from incarceration that I was picking up um, every day to come work with me, and I'm seeing their living conditions. These are guys that I was, some of them I was behind the wall with. So they may have done 10, 5, 10, 15 years, whatever, and they're in this living condition. I'm picking them up, and I'm seeing this. Um, needless to say, some of these individuals are homeless now, are back in prison, are on drugs. Um, and some of them are fine, um, and they're working, and they're just trying to put it together. But I, I, I incorporate in my mind the ones that went left towards the drugs or back to what they knew prior to their release and, and coming home. I believe it was the way that they started out. I believe they didn't have the community there, or they didn't have the the family member or somebody there telling them, hey, we see you, we recognize you're here, and we support you, and we got your back. What I realized is that, and the reason why I had said that those are just things that I can do for people, because I realized last year at, a, at the Innocence Project conference, I realized that um, there was a lot of individuals around me that had orgs, uh, nonprofits, and stuff like that. I really didn't know too much about it. But there was something in me last year that made me go to these workshops. And then I went and uh, volunteered some time with one of the individuals who was doing a community giveaway out there in Arizona. Um, so when I went and I just felt like this is something that I want to do for my community and got on the phone, started talking to people before I even left the state. I was on the phone talking to wanting to get this going. Fast forward. Um, to today, we started the teams there. Um, or I'm sure the slide probably has mm -hmm. by already, but uh, and I'm sorry, y'all. I'm just rushing, trying to get as much in as possible because I want I want you guys to really understand. Um, for the ones who may not know, like our the, the passion, where this is all coming from. Um, a lot of the individuals, even like um. So I have my family here, my wife, my daughter, Megan's here, uh, Curtis and his wife. Uh, a lot of the individuals that are that comes from our organization have either been impacted, Curtis himself, myself, and other individuals have been impacted by, uh, I mean, we've done the time we've been, you know, so we have that lived experience in our families and friends that had to go through that time with us. Uh, so... Everybody around that comes and helps and volunteers, if you come to our events, you'll see these same people here. They'll be serving food or they'll be helping this, helping that, you know, helping whatever it is, you know. Um, so we kind of were close in that sense. And I think we all shared and had that passion. Um, so when we have these events, you know, we're giving out food, haircuts. Um, the kids are there at the team. So we throw the events at the team center. So like there's just games going, there's kids running around, you know, 
Uh, the last one, we they were getting their nails done, and the girls were like getting their hair done, and like that was the best one for me because the first three they had uh, they were uh, all just the boys getting their hair cuts, and then the girls needed some stuff too, you know. And uh, so that one we did the facials, we did the hair, nails, and something else for the girls, but. Eyelashes. Like, we have girls just like posing and they're just, you know, and you got the boys coming out the barber shop. They're just looking good and feeling good, which is what we're all about, right? So when the youth are looking good, feeling good, and they're feeling loved, we know that they're going to put that back out there in the community. That's what we're all about when it comes to the youth outreach. Um, we feel that it's important because. You can remember the song, most of us in here do, the children are our future. So if we do not give back to them, um, especially the ones who maybe does not get the love that they need, you know, um, it's just unfortunate, but that's how it goes. There's kids out here that do not get the love that they need. And the foundation, not to be confused with a foundation that gives out money, but the foundation comes from the, the mindset of my, uh, it was conceived in my mind because of my construction background, right? If you have a strong foundation, you can build anything on it as long as you support the foundation, right? If you dig down, or most people, some people know when you do a foundation, you dig down first, right? You look for the hardest part of the earth, then you pour the concrete, let the concrete settle, dry out, and then you can build on top of it. Um, and that's what we want to do for the youth. We want to be able to be here. We want to be understanding and let them know that we see them the same way that the individual that's coming home from prison. We want them to know that we see them. Because if you don't, if you if they think you don't see them, they will do stuff to make you see them. <laughs> you know, and whether it's good or bad. Um, fortunately for me, um, you know, a, a, a big passion of it is seeing my kids grow up without their dad while watching it, right? So I would call, um, they, like I said, they would come to visits and stuff like that. They would come to back to school events, all the little things, as much as we could, we we kept the family together. Um, my wife specifically, because I was just sitting there waiting for them to come, right? I didn't have to do much, just walk to the visiting room. But, um, but so knowing that and seeing that with my kids, um, I was blessed to wear they have been able to take a lot that they have going on. My son will be graduating from college next month. Yeah. Uh, um, he'll be getting his bachelor's from the University of Las Vegas out in um, uh, Vegas. And, uh, and so actually that's where I'll be flying out tonight. He has two more years of eligibility to play football. And so I'll be going out to Eastern Michigan to go talk and sit with those schools out there to see if maybe that's his next stop while he does his next two years to get his master. Um, and possibly pros is what we're pushing for, right, Dad? No, we're pushing for these pros. And then I have my daughter who's a junior in high school. She's going to um, Cascadia Tech studying dentistry. Um, she's getting good grades. She's the president of the Black Student Union over there. And, uh, uh, she works a job, which I'm not too happy about, but she has a job. Um, and only because I'm uh, the entrepreneur spirit. When I came home, I tried to have a job. It's just hard for me to work for people. I don't know what happened to me. I just not good at it. But um, And I want her to invest in herself first before she get out here and start working. All of us adults know once you start working, you don't stop. You got to work, right? Um, and so, once again... That is the, the part in the passion. So, like, even when I'm thinking about these kids, we don't zero in on it. We don't talk about it a lot. But we are trying to focus on the kids that has incarcerated parents, that maybe has a, a, a brother or sister that's incarcerated, which just opening up the teen center, having these kids come in here and have fun, we bump into these things. They're right there. They're right in front of us. And that's what makes the kids open up. Right. Once they realize that you connect in that way and you're not just an adult and you're not just adulting around them all the time, they understand that. Because we tell them all the time, oh, I was your age, but we don't tell them what we did at their age. Right. It's kind of just like, I know what you're up to because we spot, we know what you're up to. But 
they don't really think that we've done it. And a lot of us don't tell them exactly what it was. So um, so that's 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 what it's about when it comes to the youth, man. Um, and as far as like the re-entry and the passion for that, once again, like being able to do the same thing, like I said, with the kids, showing people that we see them, showing individuals that we see them and that we now they we have to, you know. We're, we're here to help you, but we also have that accountability thing, right? We want them to be accountable and to have that sense of pride. We're like, I didn't just get carried my way home. When I came home, I didn't get carried through it. I, I, I got some help, but and then I did the rest, right? So that's how we want individuals to feel. So we push that accountability thing um, real tough, you know. Um, the guy that called me now from his side, um, the Washington side of prisons, where, you know, we have individuals who can talk to people before they come home. So we know exactly what's going on inside those walls as well. Curtis has a lot of connections. I have a lot of connections inside of there. So um, there are people who love and respect us who are telling people, hey, this is what they're doing. And if you're going to be a part of what they have going on, you got to be serious because they're going to have your back. And this is and this is serious. There's other brothers in here that have done time that understand what it's about, man, and they understand those hurdles, right? Um, and they understand being able to be proud of who you are after that, you know, not, not to be proud of, we're not saying that what we did, people should honor that or who we were before we went to prison, people should honor that. But what we're saying is that you got to give people that chance, that second chance and that chance to say, okay, um, we we see you and we expect you to do it. We expect you to do better. Right, people expect you to do better. I wake up every day and expect myself to do better. Sometimes it drives me crazy um, because everything can't come fast enough, and then or sometimes there's too much coming, and I gotta start slowing stuff down. Okay, okay me, where am I at? Who am I? You know, and that's another thing when it comes to mental health and stuff like that. Honestly, that was a big part of me wanting to push for this as well because it is that thing where. I, I came across times, as strong as I was, the family I had, the support I had, I came across times, and it, it could have been self-inflicted because I was working so hard and just doing what I but sometimes I had to stop and check myself. I think, but you know, who am I? What's going on? Um, and so once I realized that, even with my support and with my strong mind, if I'm going through it, some of my buddies who went back to prison or some of my buddies who decided to kind of dibble dabble with things that they should be doing, Where's their mind at, right? This guy came home, he didn't have family. He had to move into a two bedroom complex with three other guys, right? And they shared that bedroom with a curtain right here. And his bed is, you know, the first step is, you know, um, it's a bed, it's a mattress. They even, it's not a bed, it's a mattress on the floor. And you expected this guy to come home after doing 15 years and say, all right, get on the straight and narrow. Where are you working at? I don't know where you work. Go find a job, right? Where are you where are you living at? This is where I'm living at. Uh, I don't know what's going on in those houses or the house, but some of them was stuff that they couldn't fight off, right? Those are demons that they couldn't fight off or, or bad habits that they couldn't fight off. I get it. I'm drug and alcohol free, and I have been since I came home and years before I released because I had the option inside of prison to do those things, as people know. Um, but I decided not to do those things. And I, like I said, I've been drug and alcohol free the whole time. But there's times where I'm 42 years old. So there's times I want to sit down and have a drink and just say, man, maybe that's what I need, right? I want to smoke a joint, right? Um, relax and, but I'm like, I know me, right? I know I have responsibility, so I, I doubt if I'll just go off the deep end. But I don't know. I might have a drink and that's it, right? Um, but I do have a goal. <laughs> Uh, before I have my drink, you know, but it'd be years and years ahead and hopefully not too far away. But um, so I go out, I, I've been out the country, I buy some bottles and stuff. So I put stuff up and I look at it. I'm not mad at taking a sip of it. You know, I'm like, I buy stuff that's not out here. So, I'm, you know, maybe before I take a drink, I might sell it or something. I don't know. But, um, or just keep it as a souvenir. But to get back on track, with this housing situation, this is one of our huge partners. Um, you know, we, we, we have this idea of how we can really help and make these things work. We have Josh in here from Partner in Career. Sorry, I'm starting at the bottom. 
right? Um, but I've grown a good relationship with the Vancouver Police Department um, and, and individuals inside of it. We actually, I actually run a class called Insight and Foresight, which is a violence prevention for the youth. And I have a session where a police officer is going to come in and speak about know your rights and stuff to the kids. I had um, the child therapists come in and they did a session with the kids. Uh, my wife does a session. Um, well, not under the insight the foresight, but we have something called manifestation through art where the kids get to draw on paper and we're going to get them to do their uh, vision boards and stuff like that. You know, get them to open up so we can figure out who they are and what they what do they see in the future and how do we get them to architect that, which is what that the violence prevention class inside the foresight is about. It's all about architecting and development. I want them to understand what an architect is, what a developer is, and understand that when they put that on paper through a composition book that I give them, that they're, that's called architecting and they're, they're being able to see it. And now, off the paper, they walk in, they're developing what they put on paper. Um, so anyway, back to the house. <laughs> um, the, the police department obviously is huge because a lot of us had this automatic thing where we just, it was them and it was us. That's how we view the police. Some people view the police as protectors of their community. Some of us view them different, and that's just how it is. We want to be able to break down that barrier with the with the good guys who are seeing into people for people, seeing humans for humans. There are there there are individuals in, with those badges and with those uniforms that see human beings, and we want to be able to bridge that gap. Um, SWAT is a huge supporter, um, and they will be. So all this is all about the re-entry housing. Um, Molina Healthcare and the library. <laughs> so we have this thing called um, Turn the Page, a program that we're trying to, um, we wish the brothers that's here now that we would have had, but what it is is, and it's not actually iconic that there's your brother here now, but the thing is, we want to be able to come and bring people to the library after hearing and talking to you for three to six months and understand it. three to six months while you're incarcerated and understand what you need, what 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 support do you need, what uh, resources do you need, and then okay, hey, meet us down here at the library. They have something for you. We have something for you, and all these community partners um, can come together and help somebody with just that with with their first steps. So um, when I said like those were only that I can only give what I could give, that what I was saying by that is that once I learned about nonprofits and how things work, I realized okay, if I come out here in the community and I get some help, I can. It don't have to just be me, right? Because I know if I give a man five hundred dollars when he's been away for ten years, five years, three years, I know that's not going to do nothing for him, right? I know. That a burger is seventeen dollars now at McDonald's. You know what I mean? Like I know that money don't stretch like it used to. You know, and, a, and sh you know, you get a guy who doesn't have a guy or a, a woman who doesn't have nowhere to go uh, or live, or they're living in a transitional house. Five hundred. That's nothing, right? Um, so we want to be able to help with that and employment and as much as we can. Um, and so. Vancouver Housing Authority was huge supporters. So this right here is the complex that uh, will be opening up this summer. Um, there, as you see, there's eight units. That 3815 is the one that would be like the office area where we'll run our reentry program. We'll run financial literacy. Uh, we'll be doing like a victim awareness and kind of like just a place where individuals can come out of their rooms and come in there and just hang out, right? Um, so the other eight or the other seven units are all two bedrooms uh, where, uh, you know, unfortunately, we're not in a position where we can just give a person their own unit, but we can at least give them their own room. Right. So they'll have a shared kitchen, a shared bathroom, but they'll have their own room. And I refuse to put any more than two people in the house. Um, and so uh, as you see. It's a, it's a, it's, you know, it's right there on the fourth lane corridor. So it's like good transportation It's down the street from the teen center. So it's kind of like, um, it's just going to be a lot of things to it, man. Like there's some, uh, remodeling ideas and stuff that 
that you know there'll be like a garden and there'll just be there'll be stuff for individuals to do and it'll be more of a welcoming thing. Um, I haven't seen every transitional house out here. I know there's like 79 or something like that, but I'm not, um, so I'm not saying like all these other ones just suck. I'm not saying that because I haven't seen them all. Just the ones that I know of helped me think of a better way to make it work for an individual that's coming home. We're not saying that it's foolproof because once again, we expect 120, 150%, but even if we expect 120% and we give you 80%, we expect you to at least get that extra 40 to where you could push because I understand that you're going to need that year or two to get your feet up under you. And, you know, some people, it may be quicker. For me, it took about a year. But once again, like I told you guys in the beginning, I had a 24-year sentence. I was released early after nine years in an extensive fight of the appeal process. But it, after two years, I was, um, I was somewhere... And I, I was in my car, and then something told me, like, you're free, right? I realized that I was free. I didn't know that I was in shock for the last two years, right? Because when I got out, I just hit the ground running. I wasn't paying attention to nothing. I had to get my son to college because I was watching college football, and I always imagined seeing him on TV, which I was able to do now. But I had to get him to college. He was a freshman in high school when I came home, 15 years old. So a lot of us that's been in trouble or made a bad decision, we understand that 15 is like a pivotal age, especially for a young man, where he's super curious. Um, if, if dad's not around, guess who's raising him? Either somebody who don't have no business raising him or your friends, right? When you go outside the house, you see mom and dad a few hours out of the day, but you hang with your buddies most of the time. So we, we determine what's good and bad, right? Um, I'm, I'm, I was always like the leader, but I was always also the follower because I did stuff to show the followers that I was the leader and I was the tough one, but I was, you know, but I was showing off for them, right? And they, they didn't know. Um, so now in return, what do they do? They show off for me. Um, and we just were making bad decisions. So once again, like I said, I do have to catch this flight. I appreciate the library they stepped in. Um, if you were here last week, we had a great thing going on with the book free. If you haven't read it, I suggest you read it. It's a good read about reentry and other individuals who came home and made changes in their lives. Um, and also, um, yeah, so we, we, you know, we appreciate the library for that. We, we look forward to having more connections. Um, and, Definitely situations like this, more resources, more more bigger, better events um, every year from here on out. Um, so I thank everyone who did come and uh, get home safe.